And all this is threatening to get a little bit confusing. We started trying to articulate the position of an embodied being, independently of the assumptions of theoretical physics. And we're not the only ones. This blind spot book is troubling the same thing. I noted in the last video that as an embodied cognitive scientist, I cannot share in an epistemology that treats the brain as if it were some kind of privileged locus to which things go in and come out. And of course, our everyday talk doesn't allow me to do anything else. The things to which I am sensitive are not the sensitivities of five kinds of receptors, for example. The alignment of the five senses with the manner in which the nervous system as a whole is integrated into a body is incoherent. So, rather than merely wallow in the mire of confusion, it might be an appropriate point in this small video series to draw a lesson. Sometimes you learn something, and as I've been making these videos, I've learned something. And it goes like this, because we can recognize the idealism of considering the brain and the manner in which we integrate it into our stories of persons. We can recognize that idealism and it's very hard to free ourselves from it. I teach cognitive science in an expansive fashion. I've designed a syllabus myself and in there I am forced to teach about behavior because what psychologists care about a lot of the time is what people do. They attribute agency, intentions, purposes to the actions that our actual movements make us look like clowns doesn't matter to them. This is a theological thing to do. It's also a practical thing to do. Law courts need to attribute responsibility to people for their actions, but as we are acting, we are anything but self-contained individuals. We see this clearest, perhaps, in the tango dance, where two people's movements become fully entwined, and the idea of one of them having a secret driver in the brain controlling things is nonsense. And here's where the contrast comes. I also teach movement science. And prior to the considerations of these videos, you might have thought movement science and behavioral science are the same thing. They're just what people do. No movement science doesn't start with psychological assumptions. It's robustly empirical. It doesn't assume that movement has a single origin or locus. The essence of movement science is to recognize the fabulously coordinate, coordinated nature of movement. Usually movement science, or a lot of it, looks at animals rather than humans, and we're less prone to make this kind of Protestant mistake of blaming ourselves for everything when we look at animals. Movement science reveals nothing of behavior. Behavior is normative. Behavior is a way of describing ongoing activity involving one or more bodies that attributes responsibility to one of those bodies, attributes goals and intentions to one of those bodies, and makes them culpable when, those bod when that goal is not met. A lot of the meaning of the term cognition is actually behavioral because we're describing the means by which we solve problems. It's not a silly way to think, but it's slightly dangerous. And so here it's time to finally draw a lesson. Having looked at a lot of movement science and a lot of behavioral science. For movement science, my favorite sources are people like Edward Moybridge, um, with his wonderful study of human and animal locomotion, or Scott Kelso in the field of coordination dynamics, a beautiful non-psychological way of looking at movement. Such movement is always smooth, coordinated, fluid. So here's the lesson. When we look at movement, we move like gods. When we look at behavior, we behave like scoundrels. Any behavior will always be subject to normative judgment, criticized, possibly failing. The whole question of karma arises. But when we look at our movements, we see none of these neuroses. 
So we move like gods and we behave like scoundrels. That seems to be our position. I'm sure we've more to say still. <laughs>